Well, um, hello everyone. Um, I hope that uh, everyone who's um, uh, joined us uh, to participate in this webinar can see and hear us all. Um, and I'd like to offer you all a very warm welcome. Um, this is a webinar hosted by Six Pump Court Chambers, of which I am the head. And the subject, as you know, is international arbitration and virtual hearings, a new era dawns. Um, the new era hasn't quite dawned yet for one of our colleagues, James Clanchy. As you can see, he's having a little technical difficulty, which, he, which I hope he will be able to overcome very soon. So bear with us on that. Um, in addition to James, you will see on your screen the other principal speakers whom I will introduce um, as they come to uh, give their presentations. They will each speak for about 10 minutes. And after that, I hope we will have a question and answer session. And um, may I please encourage everyone who is watching and listening to um, write their questions in the Q&A box, and then I will be able to see them when we get to that stage, and I will endeavor to select questions for the panelists to answer. And we have a few questions which have already been sent in. Um, uh, you will see on your screens, in addition to myself and in addition to the main speakers, two other colleagues, Natasha Hausdorf and uh, Chemko Kvagos, who um, will be joining us in the Q&A session and who will contribute at that stage. And we're very grateful to them for doing that. Um, I see that James has joined us and we will find out in a moment whether he is, um, a, a, he was having some difficulties with his, uh, with his uh, audio, but um, we'll find out shortly whether, whether those difficulties are involved. Um, right. Um, Without more ado, I will hand over to my esteemed colleague, Andrew Moran, QC, a full-time international commercial arbitrator based in Sydney, uh, based in Singapore, I beg your pardon, and um, invite him to speak first on the Asian approach to virtual hearing. Andrew. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone from Singapore. Uh, just after six o'clock here, uh, interesting it is that in international arbitration, uh, we at Pump Court span most of the um, arbitration world from uh, Dublin, uh, I think is the furthest point east from uh, me, uh, to the Margaret River in Australia. So I hope we're able to give you uh, a useful picture of how we are dealing with things across the world uh, in international arbitration. Uh, as Stephen has told you, I'm a full-time arbitrator based in Singapore, but of course, um, before COVID came, uh, I traveled all over, uh, <clears throat> and um, that has been curtailed by what we are now dealing with. So if I can just begin by telling you of what guidance and protocols uh, are actually in use in Singapore, and you'll all, of course, recall uh, that we got it first here. So that we've start, we had to start dealing uh, with this problem uh, somewhat earlier than you have all done in uh, Europe and the United Kingdom and in Ireland. Um, we have a list of protocols and guidance. I'm not going to speak to those because we've adopted another approach, which I will explain to you uh, briefly. Um, and what uh, essentially uh, we we had were protocols coming out thick and fast. I'll just mention a few of them that we have used and from which we have derived the practices that we're following in this region. Uh, the start, and, and one of the best was the sole protocol on video conferencing. You needn't uh, note any of this down. Uh, you will have the list and web links uh, on a PowerPoint which will be placed on the website after this webinar. So we had that one as a starting point. It's a very good technical uh, offering, uh, and I commend it to you if you're actually in the business of uh, starting uh, from fresh and reinventing the wheel. Then, of course, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators guidance note, you'll know of that. ICC guidance note on possible measures aimed at mitigating the effects 
of the COVID-19 pandemic, the AAA ICDR virtual hearing guide for arbitrators and parties, a very good paper I commend to you. It's available on practical law. It actually has a model form of directions. It's called COVID-19 tips for arbitrating uh, during the pandemic. There's the Delos checklist on uh, holding arbitration and mediation hearings in times of COVID. And what I have to say, uh, and it comes hard for a man uh, who is the chairman of the procedure committee of the Singapore Chamber of Maritime Arbitration, probably the best guidance and protocol uh, is from the London Maritime Arbitration Association. It's very good and it's adaptable to all types of uh, arbitration. So you can use that um, uh, when you uh, need to. But what we've done here, uh, and I've been asked to draft, are various forms of specimen directions uh, for virtual hearings. They can, of course, be all singing and dancing, cover everything, and in some cases they need to be when parties in an arbitration are not sophisticated or represented by uh, sophisticated arbitration lawyers. So you adapt as the circumstances require the directions that you uh, use. This is from an arbitrator's point of view. I'm telling you really how we are trying to do it. So as I say, I've been asked to draft some specimen directions by uh, some institutions in this region. And the next one out, um, I'll give another plug for the SCMA. Uh, it should be up on their website in a week or two, some specimen directions uh, I and my colleagues have uh, drafted. And what they do essentially is to give you a vade mecum <coughs> through, the, through the process of dealing with um, uh, an arbitration, an international arbitration conducted by virtual or hybrid virtual means. I don't know whether you're familiar with that uh, terminology, but essentially the latter hybrid virtual is a mix. Uh, I'm doing one next week where I will be sitting in a room, I'm the sole arbitrator in Maxwell Chambers in Singapore. The advocates will be in Singapore, but parties and witnesses will be in Indonesia, uh, in India and in Singapore. Uh, but the, the parties are not uh, attending uh, in order to maintain the level playing field. Very important in the directions to um, identify the platform uh, that you are going to use from amongst the various options, and you'll know there are various options. The most common ones seem to be Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Blue Jeans, and GoToMeeting. Uh, we use tend to use Zoom. I'm not uh, advertising any particular one, but you need to state that in the directions, and you need to decide as parties which one you're going to use. One important direction, and this comes from experience, is this, all active participants at the hearing shall familiarize themselves to a sufficient degree with the use of the platform prior to the hearing in order to ensure the hearing proceeds efficiently and without interruption. And I can tell you before I started putting that in, that people would turn up thinking this was all a bit of fun and we could press a button and participate very easily. Not so, you need to be prepared for it. Uh, then also included in the specimen directions is, uh, at your option, uh, a direction to engage a, a support vendor. That is a, a service provider that will provide, especially in the case of a hybrid virtual hearing, the hearing room and all of the technology uh, to connect all of the uh, participants in the arbitration, wherever they may be. In Singapore, the most prominent provider is Maxwell Chambers, which you've probably heard of. But the objective of the direction and the engagement of a vendor, a term now in common use, is to ensure security of access to the hearing, to assist and support the host in operating the platform, and to work with the tribunal and the parties to resolve any difficulties that may arise concerning the use of the platform and connectivity with participants uh, during the hearing. You also may make provision, uh, rather like uh, I had to make for the hearing I just referred to next week, that the tribunal, uh, if a tribunal of three, 
may participate from a single location. So the tribunal is together if they're all in the same uh, country. And then you provide that no other participants may be at the same location used by the tribunal, again, to keep maintain uh, fairness. Uh, it's also useful if you're doing a hybrid a virtual hearing to have a list of those uh, participants who will be physically present in the hearing room and those who will attend and the various places from which they are attending. And then quickly skipping through the rest of the directions, the things that we have um, included and what we look to arrange in giving directions and ensure uh, are done for the virtual hearings. Simple things, they may be obvious, but they are unfortunately sometimes forgotten. Circulation of contact sheets to each and every participant. Uh, directions, particularly important, and we've had it uh, today amongst us, I think and hope it's resolved. Directions to avoid and deal with failures in and alternative means of connection, should connect fall down. The critical direction, I think, and have found, is the direction to have a dry run or a test session. Uh, and that includes for document management and display across the media that you are using. That, that is critical. Coupled with it, um, I always now issue a direction to have a hyperlinked index of the hearing bundle documents which can either be managed by the host, the advocate examining a witness, or the vendor under the direction of the advocates. Click on the hyperlink, sh share the screen, the document uh, comes up, the witness can see it, the tribunal can see it, he can be asked about it. So that's a, a very important uh, direction to have. It's also important uh, to have uh, a direction as to hearing etiquette and management, virtual waiting rooms, visibility of people in the room, no over speaking. Uh, I also direct no virtual background, so you can see all the rubbish here behind me. I'm a real person in a real place, not on a tropical beach somewhere. Um, chaperones, you may need to provide for chaperones for witnesses, especially in a fraud case. Again, the case I'm doing next week, there are allegations of fraud, so we uh, have uh, chaperones provided uh, for that, and also provision for um, an all-round view. I'm going to conclude my 10 minutes very quickly by saying a word about virtual advocacy. Uh, it is a brave new world, and I think it's actually a very exciting new world. Uh, I wish I was an advocate in it. I'm not any longer. Uh, but what you need to bear in mind is that though virtual hearings present new challenges, they also pre present some advantages, uh, particularly to the enterprising and tech savvy uh, advocate. It's particularly impressive in Asian, Asian arbitrations, I have to say to you, and I can make a comparison because I do arbitrations in Europe uh, and in Asia. Uh, the use by advocates here of presentational technology is first class. Even PowerPoint, just PowerPoint probably the best, but it has some very useful and effective features. I have been astonished by the quality of presentation from complex corporate commercial transactions, financing transactions in oil field disputes, one I'm doing uh, at the moment, uh, to presentation of authorities so that you use the more fade, push, wipe, split, reveal, cut, facilities so that documents are flashed onto the screen, you see them, they're short bites, enough to read, and they have a tremendous impact. So that remarkable effect does provide opportunities for new kinds of advocacy. I commend it to you, and I leave you with this thought. Do not be dismayed. It actually presents an opportunity to level the playing field in arbitration in international arbitration that was not there, is not there in some cases. So that advocates who may not be, it may not be their first language, the language of the arbitration, but they can be just as effective using some of the modern techniques we've had to employ here in Asia to conduct virtual arbitrations.
I'm done, I think, within my 10 minutes. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. And uh, uh, let me take the opportunity to um, um, mention two things uh, which Andrew touched on. Firstly, um, we do intend um, not only to make available a recording of this webinar, but also to circulate materials afterwards and put materials on our website so that where uh, speakers refer, as Andrew did, to document protocols, uh, draft directions and so forth, those will be available for you to look at. And secondly, just a reminder, if I may, uh, nobody has yet put any questions on the Q&A, but please feel free to do so. And it's probably as well to do that while the remarks of the speaker are fresh in your mind. So anything you've got for Andrew, quickly type that in straight away. And now we'll move, if we can, to Stephen Walker QC, um, an international commercial lawyer, a QC in England and in Scotland, um, with a practice uh, that encompasses, of course, international arbitration. And he is going to give a personal perspective in a globally changing world. So Stephen, over to you. You're still on mute at the moment, Stephen. I think you can hear me now. We can. The new era has dawned for you. Okay, let me, let me just take you through the new era. Stephen, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening from Perth, Western Australia. Uh, I speak to you all this evening from a modest 14 and a half thousand kilometers from London. It's never been a better or an easier time uh, to be an arbitration lawyer and to live in one jurisdiction, to practice in others and have clients in many more. The world is truly a global marketplace as never before. And it's never been easier to conduct transnational business from the comfort of your own home study. Of course, this is all facilitated by the wonderful technology we are using today. But even more importantly, and largely as a consequence of COVID, there is a general acceptance in the business and legal community of doing business differently. All of this creates a new and exciting era for international arbitration practitioners, for arbitrators, and perhaps most importantly of all, for clients. I have been practicing international arbitration since the late 1990s, largely at the bar, but also early in my career at Allen & Overy. For many years, institutional arbitration has been heavily focused and responsive to the needs of the international business community. The international business community has embraced international arbitration. Of course, for many reasons for this, but uh, I would pick three main ones, uh, three main ones why the international business community prefers international arbitration. Firstly, it's a relatively quick process, if done properly. Uh, it's about as quick as a UK litigation for example, from start to finish. It can also be a high quality process as long as you get the right arbitrators. The most important thing in any arbitration is getting the right arbitrators. I think the next most important thing is getting the right set of rules. The third, the third important thing for the international business community is that it produces a judgment termed an award which is generally easier to enforce than the judgment of the national court. The success and main attraction to the international business community, the users of international arbitration, in my experience, is enforceability. It's all about the best way to protect your transnational investment. When I last looked, about 165 countries 
around the world are parties to the New York Convention, which underpins the international enforceability of awards. There is nothing as comprehensive as the New York Convention for the international recognition and enforcement of court judgments. If you are doing business, or indeed if your clients are doing business internationally, the best way to protect your investment is by ensuring you have a well-drafted and, in my view, an international arbitration clause from one of the leading institutions. If you do that, you can't go far wrong. I would, as a general rule, tend to avoid ad hoc arbitration. It can be problematic, especially at the early stages, especially in times of COVID or future pandemics. Stick with institutional arbitration. You can't go far wrong. If you do nothing else other than go to the ICC, LCIA, or CIAC websites, or indeed another leading institution, and simply copy and paste one of the many precedent arbitration clauses, that should be sufficient. If you are particularly smart for extra investment protection, you will also corporately structure your investment or your client's investment to take advantage of any available investment treaty arbitration under any bilateral or multilateral investment treaty. Arbitration has always been very progressive. Embracing the choice of arbitrators, a profession. Do you want a lawyer? Do you want an engineer? Do you want an accountant? The number of arbitrators. Do you want one? Do you want three? Are three heads better than one? Not always. Procedural hearings by phone, submission style pleadings, witness statements, different ways of arbitrating from documents only arbitration to even not that I would suggest it, allowing the tribunal to decide a dispute ex aquio et bono, according to the right and good in accordance with fairness. Looking back, I had my first virtual hearing more than 20 years ago. In those days, it was called an audio visual link you had to seek out and go to a special room that had all the audio-visual equipment. And let me tell you, it was a clunky affair with satellite delay, with people freezing, with everyone unable to find exhibits, including me, everyone either not hearing, interrupting, or speaking over the other. The sound quality was horrendous. Yet we in the international arbitration community persevered and eventually the technology started to catch up. Yet culturally, the business and legal community still preferred face-to-face -face meetings. They still preferred hearings in person. And so those like myself, keen on living in one place and practicing in others, had to use planes in the way others use buses. Then, ladies and gentlemen, COVID arrived and the modern world stopped. The old era of doing business ended and a new era was forced upon us. Some of us were more ready than others. Fortunately, and unlike most governments around the world, the arbitration community was ready. It was business as usual. The leading arbitration institutions all encourage parties to press on, avoid delay, do things virtually. Sophisticated online virtual hearing platforms like Epic were ready to assist. They work very well and they're relatively competitively priced when you compare the cost uh, of sending arbitrators and counsel and witnesses to some far off exotic location, flying them there, accommodation, and all the other costs associated with a physical hearing. So arbitration is now truly global and clients can globally choose their counsel and arbitrators. We lawyers can seek out new clients abroad and service those clients like never before. So a new era is 
volume. It has volume. And in my view, it should make arbitrations quicker, cheaper, and perhaps easier. Of course, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you the news is not all positive, uh, as I fear my days are numbered for my Emirates Platinum status. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Stephen, um, for that fascinating uh, personal perspective and um, for your views on um, institutional and ad hoc, uh, which I suspect may provoke a little bit of discussion later on. Um, so uh, we will now move, if we may, um, to almost the other side of the world, uh, to Dublin, and to our colleague Paul McGarry, senior counsel uh, based in the Republic of Ireland, a former chair of the bar there, who practices now as an international arbitrator and litigator, and he is going to uh, talk to us, and I'm fascinated to, to listen to this, about virtual hearings, the bad and the ugly. Paul, over to you. Hmm. Thank you, Stephen. Um, it's a, a great privilege uh, to be part of uh, what is a truly global event, given the location of uh, some of the panelists uh, this morning or indeed this evening in the case of the last speaker. Um, can I say at the outset that I am a huge supporter of the notion of uh, virtual hearings in, in international arbitration? Um, I suppose everybody is really, um, or at least they are pretending to be, because that's the, the fashion at the moment. And um, what, what I'm going to talk about uh, in the few minutes available to me <coughs> is the fully virtual concept as opposed to the hybrid or partial uh, version that um, uh, that Andrew spoke about earlier. That's where some of the parties and especially the tribunal are in one location and other people are beamed in, so to speak. And um, so what I propose to do is to make a couple of general observations about these types of hearings uh, and how to avoid some of the problems that can arise and give some examples of things that can go wrong or drawbacks with the system, both from my own experience and from those of colleagues I've spoken with. Um, I should say also at the outset that there is a vast range of material available on the subject of virtual hearings in the form of guidance and protocols from the arbitral institutions and from what's loosely described as the arbitration community online, if I can call it that. There are a wealth of uh, very good blogs and articles available uh, at all times. Um, the first big issue, it, it seems to me, is, is cost. <clears throat> and while the international arbitration is ideally suited uh, to the use of remote hearings, and indeed there have been forms of remote hearings, as Stephen has said, going on for years, um, I, I don't subscribe to the notion that it's necessarily the case that it's always less expensive for the parties. Yes, it's more efficient, uh, of course it's more environmentally friendly, and there are significant savings in travel and venue costs. But uh, the time taken to prepare for all aspects of the hearing, uh, the preparation of material, dealing with witnesses, communications within the legal teams, and indeed the hearing itself, often take longer and are much more complex to organize. And that's particularly the case if everybody involved is not at the same level of technological competence or indeed is using different forms of communications and document systems. Because uh, no matter what protocols or guidelines you have available, everything depends on the individuals in the virtual space. Everybody needs to be at a certain level of competence in relation to technology. It helps, of course, if everybody is at the same level and indeed if that level is very high, but sadly we know that that is not always the case. In my view, at least one senior lawyer in each of the parties and all the members of the tribunal needs to be able to quickly understand and use the systems perfectly. So how do virtual hearings look in the context of the two things that make arbitration such an attractive alternative to the courts? Um, and how, do the, does the concept of the virtual hearing impact on those? And of course, those two things are, as we know, confidentiality 
and party autonomy. Um, fr from the perspective of confidentiality, uh, this, of course, is a new way of doing things. Um, and again, parties and the tribunal need to be careful about how everything is organized. Uh, generally, in international arbitration, the lawyers are familiar with cyber and data security, but I've heard a couple of stories about information seeping out from tribunal hearings. And usually this is again because of some unfamiliarity with the systems. It shouldn't be a problem. And of course, bear in mind that there are protocols about this that have been issued by the ICC, the LCIA and the other institutions. Party autonomy it can be a bit more tricky. Um, I, I think this is because of a reluctance on the part of some tribunals to be more assertive about the process. Um, some tribunals take party autonomy very far in the context of the organization of hearings, and it's not just in the virtual uh, uh, context. And um, as this is a procedural issue, it's my view that the tribunal can afford to be a lot more assertive about how the hearing is going to be organized. Yes, of course, get the parties to try to agree everything relating to bundles, witnesses, timings, systems, and so on. But I think tribunals need to realize that it's not going to be challenged, or they're not going to be challenged if they insist on certain things being done. This is, after all, no more than a process. It's not the substance of the claim. Um, and again, as I said, the institutions have moved to try to ensure that flexibility is the order of the day and to encourage the parties to embrace the new way of working. Uh, it's worth noting, I think, that the joint guidance put out by some of them earlier this year was the first time that any of us can remember that the arbitral institutions collaborated on anything. Um, and I should say also, the situation might be slightly different when it comes to ad hoc arbitration, but I, I don't see why it should be, and I'd be interested to know if that is the experience of those that have, that have uh, done more in the way of ad hoc ar arbitration. So, um, to uh, identify some problems with remote hearings. Um, of course, the extent to which these problems are avoidable will vary greatly. And I'm not going to talk about the obvious things about how people dress or look at the camera, uh, things in the background like pets or children or worse, familiarity with the systems and so on. These are all the types of things that should be fairly obvious. And um, first, I believe that virtual hearings often encourage bad advocacy or worse. And by bad advocacy, I mean that the absence of the physical staged environment makes it much more difficult to focus on what you're doing if you're a counsel. It, it might encourage you to read from a script or allow a witness to escape from cross-examination uh, and again, this is often caused by unfamiliarity with the system or delays in the communications process. Well-trained witnesses will take advantage of remote systems to avoid being cornered. And I suppose that's natural. Um, and when I say worse than bad advocacy, I'm talking about borderline ethical issues. And um, I'll give you one example. I was sitting on a tribunal this summer where my colleague was asking questions uh, that were very difficult for the uh, counsel involved. Um, it, it was getting quite hot and heavy. Uh, suddenly the screen went dead and we heard some noises. Um, can you hear me? Are you there? Doesn't seem to be working and so on. A 10 minute break to sort everything out. But of course, the steam had gone out of the exchange by then and the tone was very different, or should I say, the answers to the questions were an awful lot better. I couldn't prove that there was anything deliberate or there was any no problem with the system, but certainly the timing of it made me very suspicious. Um, a second major problem is that virtual hearings also have the potential to encourage poor uh, adjudication. Um, for example, it's much more difficult in a virtual context to appreciate the extent to which the tribunal members are engaged in a point or indeed are actually listening at all. A big issue I've noticed is the unwillingness of tribunals to engage with counsel until the submissions have been finished 
and sometimes even there is no engagement at all. Now, this is also a problem, in fairness, with virtual hearings in court. Uh, and in our system, it's becoming a bit of a problem. Uh, if I'm a counsel, I like to know how my submissions are being received, especially if I'm uh, intending to make a number of points. If I have to wait until the very end for questions or there are no questions at all, it's very difficult to know in some cases how things have gone. Um, the final point I want to make uh, relates to documentation. Um, this is probably, in my experience, the biggest problem with virtual hearings. Um, preparation of hearing bundles according to agreed procedures and timeframes for submission and so on usually work fine. But the problems tend to arise at the hearings when reference is being made to individual documents and everybody has to have the same paragraph on the same page uh, at the same time. Um, this usually stems from the inability to appreciate that everybody needs to operate off multiple devices. Council need to be able to communicate with their own clients and the rest of the legal team. They need to be able to refer to documents in the bundle uh, and they need to be in the virtual hearing. Uh, frequently, they will need a backup for the virtual hearing in case there is a problem with the system. That means that unless you have a very sophisticated operation, you will need a minimum of three different devices. So uh, to conclude, um, everything really depends on the nature of the dispute and the identity of the parties. Civil uh, practitioners it will be less concerned about the oral hearing and perhaps more concerned about the documentation issue. Obviously, the more complex the dispute, the more issues that are likely to arise at the oral hearing. The last thing I will say, of course, is that as with physical hearings, the most important thing is preparation. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, <clears throat> and. Um, I hope it will be welcome to everybody uh, watching and listening that we have not merely geographical diversity, but a diversity of perspectives in this webinar, um, as Paul's um, interesting talk has illustrated. <clears throat> now we turn to my colleague in London, Anthony Conaty, um, a barrister with, with uh, a practice both as an arbitrator, as a mediator, and as a uh, litigator. And, um, he is going to talk about the future of international arbitration following the pandemic, and in particular, the hybrid hearing. So, Anthony, over to you. Stephen, many thanks. Um, as Stephen says, I'm going to speak about the future of the international arbitration following the pandemic and look in particular uh, at the idea of a hybrid hearing. Um, my paper, which will be distributed after this webinar, looks at coronavirus and its impact generally, then its impact on litigation, and its current impact on international arbitration, and then the future of international arbitration in the light of COVID-19. But first of all, a look at the impact of the virus generally. And there are few areas of commerce which are unscathed. For example, according to a survey published in the art newspaper in May this year, art galleries around the world are expected to lose more than 70% of their revenue as a result of the pandemic. Around one third of the galleries do not expect to survive. And the May edition of the art newspaper reported that the New York Met is forecasting a $100 million loss. In the world of fashion, um, stores are closed, orders cancelled, factories shut. Um, the view is that COVID-19 uh, has ushered in a reckoning for the 2.2 trillion fashion and luxury industries. And if we look at the property market, that has also been badly affected. According to Zoopla, some 373,000 transactions were on hold in the UK with a total value of 82 billion pounds. Uh, turning now to the impact of uh, COVID-19 on litigation, the effect on lawyers, first of all, 
Um, according to the Law Society, 71% of community law firms said that reduced incomes during coronavirus have put them at risk of collapse. Something like 800 firms responded to the Law Society survey. The president of the survey stated that there are widespread concerns over the liquidity of firms which are facing a dramatic plunge in income. And the impact of the pandemic on lawyers is something which affects the UK economy as a whole. David Lammy, the Shadow Secretary of State for Justice, says that getting lawyers back to work is crucial for restarting the economy and beginning the recovery. And he's reported in the Financial Times in August as saying this, the UK has the second largest legal sector in the world, second only to the US. It contributes almost 60, 60 billion pounds in gross value added to the UK economy each year. And it supports around 552,000 full-time employees. English law is one of our strongest global experts exports used in commercial contracts internationally, making London the top choice seat for arbitration. In this crisis, it has been a, a world leading innovator in using remote technology. Well, some may question whether London is the top choice, but it's certainly one of the major choices if it's not the top choice. Um, turning now to the effect on the civil courts, a protocol regarding remote hearings that was uh, issued in March this year by the Master of the Rolls and others, and I've set that out, uh, the detail of that in my paper. As to the criminal courts, um, a letter from HM Courts and Tribunal Service the 27th of March announced a temporary change was being made to the way in which the courts and tribunals will operate during COVID-19. And again, I set that out uh, in the paper. But turning now to COVID-19 and its current impact on international arbitration, I'm going to look at five matters, existing procedures, arbitral institutions and remote processes that they put forward, guidance notes, webinars, suggestions from institutions and platforms for virtual hearings. Looking now, first of all, at existing procedures, as has already been made clear by other speakers, international arbitration is already familiar with remote clear hearings in one form or another. And the impact of coronavirus on international arbitration is therefore comparatively limited. Uh, my experience as counsel and arbitrator in the conduct of international arbitration, whether institutional or ad hoc, is that various procedures are already used which may be labelled remote. Um, acting as counsel or arbitrator at LCIA, ICC, AAA, CTAC, CIR, Stockholm, Lagos, LME, London Metal Exchange, ICA, International Commerce Association, and in our ad hoc arbitrations, my experience is that the procedure as an arbitration is likely to involve matters such as the use of telephone conferences, for example, in the preliminary meeting where the tribunal and the parties plan the future conduct of the, of the arbitration, a vital stage in any large arbitration. Then at the later stages of the arbitration where interlocutory matters are dealt with by telephone conferences. Next, the use of emails throughout the course of the arbitration in communications between the parties and the tribunal. Then the service by the parties by email of written submissions on issues arising during the course of the arbitration. And then the issues by the tribunal of procedural orders dealing with matters arising in the arbitration. For example, in relation to pleadings, document disputes, red fern schedules, factual witnesses and expert witnesses, directions on matters leading to a hearing, such as the pre-hearing submissions, agreed bundles, witnesses, and the order of speeches by advocates and usually in a, in a large arbitration, uh, the submission of post-hearing submissions. But international arbitral institutions already make provisions for remote procedures, and these range from documents only arbitrations to institutional rules which make provisions for the use of remote processes within an arbitration. 
And with parties in different countries and in different time zones, such remote procedures are of considerable help. And there are many examples, and I'll just take a few. Um, looking now at arbitral institutions and the provisions for remote processes, uh, in my paper I've mentioned five, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, ICC, CTAC, AAA and the LCIA. And I'll just deal briefly with the LCIA because they've just updated their rules and those rules contain specific provisions relating to remote hearings. Um, for example, uh, Article 14.3 uh, deals with video conferencing and using other communications and technology. 14.6, the arbitral tribunal in, may use technology to enhance the efficiency and expeditious conduct of the arbitration. And 19.2 deals specifically with the organization of the conduct of a hearing and makes it clear that the hearing may take place in person or virtually by conference call, video conference or other communication technology. And the final interesting point in the updated rules is that Article 26.2 expressly provides that any award may now be signed electronically. Uh, moving on to guidance notes, uh, mention of these has been made already. I've referred to a number of them in the paper. Um, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, ICC, CTAC, AAA, LCIA. I'll just refer to the ICC, which seem to be particularly um, popular. Uh, they published their guidance note on possible measures aimed at mitigating the effect of COVID-19. And that provides guidance on possible measures that may be considered. For example, there's a checklist for protocol on virtual hearings. Um, that deals with documents only. It deals with aspects such as the virtual hearing room, whether there should be a 360 degree view of all participating rooms, whether that's required, and agreements in relation to virtual rooms themselves. And there's a section on online etiquette and due process lists. I've set those out in the paper. Um, there have been a number of webinars, well, there have been many webinars going on from about March onwards um, with suggestions from various institutions. In my paper, I've mentioned a number, ICC UK, LCIA and the Netherlands Arbitration Institute. I'll just refer to the Netherlands um, webinar, which took place very recently at the end of August. Um, that was on what I think is a very important topic, the examination of fact witnesses and expert witnesses through virtual means. And the speakers were Juan, Juan Fernandez Armesto and Albert Jan van den Berg. Um, the suggestions for dealing with the examination of witnesses, and I think this is looking more at factual witnesses rather than expert witnesses, is ensuring that only the witness statement is available to the witness in the virtual room. Secondly, that one other person should be in that room with the witness, probably a lawyer, and that person incidentally could be available to assist the witness in locating documents. I mean, the example I gave of you, the witness is a farmer, he's unlikely to be able to handle uh, looking at um, electronic documents. Question of whether there should be two cameras in the room one camera to be 360 degrees and sighted behind the witness. Uh, Article 28 of the NAI rules deals with witnesses and experts. That provides that the arbitral tribunal shall determine the time and place for the oral examination of a witness. And the view of Professor van den Berg was that oral examination now must include the oral examination uh, of witnesses at a virtual hearing. And, I mentioned two examples of problems in relation to examining witnesses and how possibly to overcome them. Um, I was sitting as a chairman of a tribunal in, in Lagos with two Nigerian lawyers. Counsel for one of the parties objected that a witness he was co examining was constantly looking at another person in the room before he answered. 
Well, we dealt with it by ordering that person to be seated in the room, but out of sight of the witness. The second example, uh, I was appointed as an arbitrator sitting at a hearing in Stockholm, and an English barrister cross-examined a Russian-speaking witness over the telephone through an interpreter. Not an easy thing to do, but he did it. Um, platforms, uh, mention of those has been made already in the paper I've mentioned too, the International Arbitration Centre Alliance uh, and the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce and Opus 2 I'll mention in a moment. Um, COVID-19 and the future of international arbitration, the hybrid hearing. I think that the conduct of international arbitration is likely to be very different following COVID-19 and the use of virtual hearings of one kind or another is bound to continue. If you're leaving aside documents only arbitrations, there are various procedures already in place to assist virtual hearings. The major international arbitral bodies give a wide discretion to arbitrators as to how an arbitration is to be conducted. The ICC and the LCIA rules, for example, specifically authorise video and telephone conferences. The arbitral tribunal, the arbitral procedures are therefore already available for the conduct of virtual hearings. And the facilities to conduct such virtual hearings are now also available to take, for example, the International Dispute Resolution Centre in Fleet Street, collaboration with Opus 2, provides a cloud-based electronic hearing platform. Will the virtual hearing take over? Forgive, forgive me interrupting, but perhaps it would be possible to move um, gradually towards a conclusion. So that yeah, I'm, I'm, near, I'm almost there, Stephen. Thank you very much. Um, virtual hearing taking over. Um, not completely, it's probably inevitable that more use will be made of remote hearings. The cost implications are obvious, particularly given the, par the parties are in, in international arbitrations tend to be based in different parts of the world and operate in different time zones. Uh, the, the launch of platforms like Opus 2, for example, supports the view that virtual hearings will become more commonplace. But if nothing else, there will always be cases where one party in an international arbitration wants its day in court. So it may be that what we will see will be a mixture uh, of arbitrations which are either hybrid mixture of the two or purely virtual. Thank you. Thanks indeed, Anthony, for that and um, for all your contributions to our um, activities. Now, um, I'm very much hoping that uh, we will be able to hear from our colleague James Clanchy. Um, uh, a, a background in his case as um, a solicitor, now a non-practicing solicitor, and in practice as um, an arbitrator uh, with a special interest in maritime arbitration. So James, um, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? That's, that's good news. I'm a fan of documents only arbitration, uh, not only because one's microphone can let one down from time to time. Um, I'm pleased uh, to be able to have this opportunity to speak about um, documents only expedited arbitration. There's no doubt that a, a lot has happened in a short space of time in the international arbitration world. And that, of course, is what expedited arbitration is all about, getting to an award uh, quickly and cost-effectively. Traditionally, the number one device for expediting an arbitration has been avoiding hearings. You avoid the time and costs involved in getting everyone together in the same room, sometimes at some great distance from their ordinary location. Now that hearings can be conducted online and that you can bring people together from around the world uh, at the touch of a button or, or the click of a mouse, will there still be a demand for documents only arbitration? And if so, will those procedures change just as those involving hearings have done? 
And those are the, the questions which I'm going to consider uh, quite expeditiously uh, just now. And I shall start by mentioning my own experience during the, the last few months. Um, I'm a sole arbitrator currently in two expedited arbitrations. And those have been completely unaffected by the pandemic. That is to say, the procedures are going quite smoothly according to the, the rules. Those rules do not envisage a hearing. Uh, no hearing will be happening. Um, the procedures are documents only, which these days means no paper at all. Uh, everything is exchanged by, by email online. And those arbitrations continue almost as if nothing had happened. The, the two I'm talking about are being conducted under the London Maritime Arbitrators Association, LMAA, small claims procedure, which is generally used for claims below $100,000. Uh, sometimes they're well below that amount. It's a procedure that's been in existence for well over uh, 20 years. It's an ad hoc procedure. There is no uh, secretariat involved. Um, there is no administration of the arbitration. Um, it's the arbitrator and the parties or their, their lawyers um, who are involved only. Uh, it's a procedure that has proved to be very successful insofar as last year in 2019, um, there were some 218 appointments of sole arbitrators in LMA SCP procedures. The, the main features, as with other expedited arbitration, are that there are very strict time limits uh, for the exchanges of submissions. There are word limits on the, on the submissions. There is no disclosure of documents. Generally, there are no witness statements. There may be experts' reports, but only in exceptional circumstances and there are no hearings. These procedures are not only quick and, and cost effective, but they can have other advantages for international arbitration that aren't always recognized. For example, they can assist in engaging uh, foreign lawyers who may not feel comfortable um, with oral advocacy in English, and may in particular not be comfortable with the Anglo-Saxon notions of cross-examination. So in fact, uh, these, what might be regarded as quite uh, simple, perhaps rather stale uh, procedures, are a way of involving uh, international uh, lawyers and parties in arbitration, in this case, uh, uh, seated in, in London. So that, that's an example of a successful ad hoc expedited arbitration procedure. The institutions um, have been rather slower in um, producing their own expedited uh, procedures. There are different reasons for that. Uh, the ICC introduced its expedited procedure in 2017, and that's actually been pretty successful. It's for claims which the ICC regards as small. That's anything below $2 million, which I think a lot of businesses would regard as actually quite a, a large uh, amount. But um, last year there were some 65 expedited procedures uh, with, the, with the ICC um, and it is generally regarded as, as working well. Uh, the LCIA has uh, never had um, its own expedited arbitration procedure um, and one reason for that uh, is actually the prevalence of ad hoc arbitration um, in, in London. Um, when I was registrar of the LCIA some 10 years ago, I, I do remember we were asked several times uh, whether the LCIA was going to introduce any sort of expedited procedure. And it was very much the view at the LCIA that uh, the LCIA's procedure ought to be capable of being expedited without having to produce any new um, 
extra rules. In order to compete with ad hoc arbitration, it was necessary to demonstrate that the LCAA's rules would produce quick, effective arbitration, even though there was the involvement of a secretariat. Interestingly, the 2020 rules, um, which Anthony has uh, just mentioned, do include some new provisions um, which basically confirm how a tribunal may expedite proceedings. Um, but again, there's no separate, separate set of rules. Meanwhile, um, ANSITRAL, in its working group two, um, is producing a set of rules for expedited proceedings in ad hoc arbitration, which could be used worldwide. Now, it's been making rather uh, stately progress, shall we say, um, on its work. Um, it had its last meeting in, in February. It's got another one coming up this month, which is to be a hybrid meeting with some of the participants um, being involved uh, virtually. But interestingly, the agenda that I've I looked at doesn't actually say anything uh, about the, the pandemic and any lessons learned from that. It will be interesting though to see whether the final version of the rules does take some account of lessons learned from, from the uh, pandemic. Uh, but in the meantime, the, the, the rules do seem to be um, somewhat uh, heavy I have to say, including, for example, a requirement that there be a case management conference at the beginning of the, of the arbitration. Uh, finally, I would like to draw your attention to um, an alternative uh, set of uh, expedited arbitration rules. These are the rules of the London Chamber of Arbitration and Mediation, LCAM. Um, that chamber uh, was revived a, a, a few years ago. Um, uh, by uh, Robert Griffiths QC of, of our chambers uh, when he was a director of the um, London Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And the LCAM is uh, associated with the, the London Chamber. Um, I assisted with the drafting of its new expedited arbitration rules. And uh, these were launched in, in June. We were able to take account already of the experience of the pandemic in, in arbitration, and in particular, the, the possibility of having a video or a telephone conference, um, not to deal with uh, evidential matters, but in order to deal expeditiously with any particular issues that, that might have been identified. So um, we, we have a, a, a rule in our new expedited arbitration rules um, that um, the arbitrator may, in their absolute discretion, hold short hearings by telephone or video conference at no additional cost for the purpose of addressing identified issues expeditiously, but there shall be no cross-examination of witnesses. So there we have, if you like, uh, hybrid rules, and I would suggest that those are the kinds of rules that um, we, we might be seeing more of um, as, as we uh, emerge from the, the current crisis. There are good reasons for adopting documents only arbitration, for looking for distinctive rules, and we don't all have to uh, drown in a Zoom soup, if you like. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, James. Yes, I'm not quite sure what a, a Zoom soup would taste like if, uh, if we had one, but um, uh, it's a, a fascinating thought. Now um, we're going to we're going to move now to the final part of this um, webinar, um, which um, is uh, the Q and A session. We have had some questions, and um, I will uh, come to those uh, shortly and um, um, invite responses to those questions from the panelists. Not not bringing in all all five of the main speakers, but asking one or two people to respond to particular questions. Um, but um, this will also give me the opportunity in a few minutes to bring in our colleague Chemko from Warsaw, who I think wants to raise a matter uh, which is certainly relevant to our topic of um, the possibility of a new era 
because he wants to say a few words about artificial intelligence, which uh, um, I'm looking forward to. But um, first, I'm going to go to our colleague Natasha, um, who you can see, um, who wants to ask a question um, about um, um, uh, one of the topics um, touched on in particular by Stephen Walker. So Natasha, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. Really arising from the remarks that we've had, I'd love to pick up on this arbitration um, ad hoc proceedings versus institutions battle in the context of the coronavirus restrictions. It's fascinating that Stephen Walker came out so strongly in favour of the institutions and certainly the response of the institutions um, has been incredibly quick uh, and impressive. Uh, Andrew Moran took us through some of the wealth of material uh, that's been produced in grappling with and developing um, responses to the situation and the implications of the restrictions for arbitration hearings. Um, and indeed, very recently, those LCIA updated um, 2020 rules provisions for those hearings. The um, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators guidance note on remote hearings emphasises in the context of this changing situation, uh, that flexibility is one of the greatest advantages of ad hoc proceedings, um, as they allow parties to orchestrate the resolution of their disputes and develop their own bespoke approaches. So I, I do wonder, is there anyone on the panel that would support the view in that guidance note, or in fact, um, has experience of parties in ad hoc proceedings responding to the current crisis? Thank you very much for that question. Now, I know that James is someone who is um, uh, a, a strong supporter of um, um, ad hoc arbitration. So I might bring you in and then perhaps go back to Stephen Walker for a further comment from him. So James, um, you first. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Well, I'm a supporter really of choice in international arbitration. I, I'm a former registrar of the LCIA, and I believe that institutional arbitration has many virtues and advantages. But um, ad hoc arbitration uh, can be made to work. And it's very important that um, we should uh, acknowledge and, and recognize it. And I have been concerned uh, recently by what I see as uh, some uh, prejudice against ad hoc arbitration, which is why I gave a paper on ad hoc arbitration and its enemies at the International Congress of Maritime Arbitrators in Rio back in March, perhaps the last of the, of the big international arbitration conferences before the pandemic really, really hit. But um, actually in, the very first presentation uh, today from Andrew Moran, um, we, we heard about uh, the LMAA's um, uh, guidelines on uh, virtual uh, hearings. And I think it's important to recognize that the LMAA, um, the London Maritime Arbitrators Association, which is only an association of arbitrators, it is not an institution, um, has a very large number of arbitrations, including uh, arbitrations involving uh, hearings. And that is an example of successful ad hoc arbitration. Arbitrators in LMA arbitrations are able to use platforms, are able to take advantage of exactly the same technology as everyone else. And I think ad hoc arbitration is just as well placed, in fact, as institutional arbitration to, to cope with the present crisis. Thank you very much. Um, Stephen, would you like to make a brief comment on this uh, topic, which I know is one that- um, Yes, yes I, would be, I would be delighted. I, I, I certainly wouldn't want it to, to be said that I'm prejudiced against uh, ad hoc uh, arbitration. Uh, ad hoc arbitration can work just as well uh, or just as badly as institutional arbitration. Um, in the ideal world, the parties involved in an arbitration would be reasonable and cooperative. In the ideal world, the lawyers acting 
for those parties would be reasonable and cooperative. But I, in, in my experience, that doesn't always happen. It doesn't always happen. And where you have uh, an ad hoc arbitration and you're just not getting cooperation from the other side on decisions like, who should we appoint as an arbitrator? What if we can't agree the appointment? What's the time frame uh, for that? What happens if we just can't agree and we have to go to the national arbitration law, the seat wherever it is, we happen to be arbitrating and go to court or go elsewhere or whatever it says in that particular piece of legislation. And then you get a court appointing an arbitrator, not necessarily an experienced arbitrator. Then of course, if such an appointment is thrust upon you, you could end up having a decision maker that is not very good at managing the process, at driving the process. And that's why, that's why you need an institution to protect you against inertia, to protect you against these sorts of early difficulties where you just can't appoint the right person. And, and if you can't appoint the right person, one of the other great things with the institutions is that they will appoint it for you. And they, they tend to drive the process and get the arbitration up and running as soon as possible. Their rules uh, are updated. They're comprehensive. They tend to be more detailed than the default rules that you would normally use in an ad hoc arbitration under the National Arbitration uh, Law of the Seat, uh, or even some of the other uh, procedural rules that you might adopt. So I think that's the, the difficulty with ad hoc. Uh, and uh, getting a good arbitrator, if you can't agree the arbitrator, getting a good one appointed by some other body that's perhaps not an arbitral body is maybe not a good idea. So I think for all of those reasons, because there is no perfect fix, um, I, I think uh, you're better with an institutional arbitration clause. Thank you very much indeed. We could spend the next 15 minutes um, on this topic, and I see that Anthony would like to come in as well, but forgive me because um, I'm going to move on. Uh, we do have... Um, uh, some questions, um, uh, as I say, from the audience, and we, we, in particular, we have a question which coincidentally touches on the very topic which I know that our colleague Chemko in Warsaw wishes to speak about. Um, what role, if any, would AI, would artificial intelligence, be able to play in the context of arbitration in the new era? So, Chemko, over to you for uh, if you would, a fairly brief uh, response on, on that topic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Uh, just very briefly, uh, I'm looking into arbitration and what's going on from uh, the perspective of, of what would uh, happen next. And I believe that we are just facing a lot of uh, changes which will uh, impact the whole uh, process and uh, artificial intelligence is all over us at the moment. It's in the medicine, it's in the gaming, it's uh, in, uh, the, even in the paintings or uh, art. So why it should not be in uh, arbitration? From this perspective, as the arbitrator, I'm looking into that uh, also as a lawyer. If I'm coming to the law firm at the moment, I'm not asking whether you are using artificial intelligence, but I'm asking the question what type of software you are using for uh, disclosure, for uh, e-discovery or whatever. So we are there already. Again, as the arbitrator, why I should not use the same type of software for identifying the document for a particular issue? or for just evaluating the arguments uh, from a certain perspective. Maybe it's a little bit against what uh, usually arbitrators would do or would look, like, would look for now, but I think uh, this, this will change. Next issue is that in, uh, with, with all the virtual hearings, we are again in the new world. We can just not only look into the, the witness, but we can uh, analyze the behavior of the witness as well as uh, the behavior of the uh, arbitrators, as was mentioned uh, here. 
and analyze it. It's like uh, just a machine that may disclose uh, not only what the witness is uh, talking about, how he's talking post factum, just to evaluate uh, the weight of his uh, presentation. So, next element is what is uh, called low code programming, which effectively allows everybody to make uh, your own applications which can uh, just serve the purpose in particular at the stage of the arbitration. So this is the next uh, issue, not necessarily uh, we need just to go and learn Python, which is not the Monty Python I mean, but uh, just the programming language, uh, but uh, I can sit now and just write the expert system which will get the parties uh, to the solutions and we'll just solve the problems. So these are the issues which uh, are uh, probably the future with all the problems related to, for example, biases in the AI or the usage of uh, information technology for evaluation of the arbitrators thriving in the US but in France at the moment. So I'm sorry, I'm just watching the clock and I think I'm close to my time span. So um, these are issues which I think we need just to consider and have in mind, have in mind because the next step will be uh, again totally different. And if we are just summarizing, if we are talking about virtual hearings now, probably it will move into, let's call this, headquarters corporate uh, virtual rooms when you have uh, the half, let's say, half is uh, low, let's say, two million uh, US dollars uh, equipment which is allowing 10 or 15 persons just to be, the, to be there and they just conduct the conferences uh, worldwide. So I think this neatly puts into the question of Mr. Just a moment, I noticed this, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Murphy, about the watches which uh, just allow the uh, witness to be controlled or just to be guided. And these are the things which will happen, in my opinion, very soon, and we must be prepared for that. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now, um, as you say, we do have a question from um, a member of the audience um, uh, addressed primarily to uh, Anthony Comity, and um, it, it, it it reads as follows, and I'll summarize slightly. It's about um, something called haptics. The, the, the scenario is a witness wearing a smart watch, which allows any third party to hear proceedings and coach a positive or negative reply to a question. So it's a bit like uh, the scenario that Paul envisaged where you need a 10 minute break, only here you don't need a 10 minute break because the instructions uh, come simultaneously um, all through the watch and via haptics which silently tap the wrist beneath the watch. <clears throat> um, so the question is what is your view as to how this technology may affect the hearing? How is this allowed for either by cameras or by a chaperone? Um, so Anthony, um, um, Mr Murphy um, directed that question to you so I, perhaps you might have a brief comment and then I might um, I might ask Paul to come in on this as well. Over to you, Anthony. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I, I think the answer would be, it's clear from that question that the use of such a watch uh, could be abused. And I think the answer would be, uh, if there is any suspicion in relation to that, that the, the tribunal must order the witness to remove the watch. Um, that would seem to be the simple answer. I don't know whether any of the, uh, the, the rules which are coming out or the guidelines which are coming out deals with this particular problem. I've not seen it anywhere, but if it did come up, well, the, the simple answer is the tribunal orders the removal. Th this obviously must only apply to factual witnesses because in the case of an expert, an expert is unlikely to be, need to be coached. And I think there are three points in relation to an expert. The first is that you can check out an expert in advance. 
uh, if he or she is a, a, a well-qualified person in a, in, a, in a large international forensic accountants or whatever it may be, you're fairly safe with that person. The second is, uh, the second point is that uh, an expert witness is not likely to need to be needed to be coached. You know, the expert is an expert and ought to know the answer himself or herself. And the third and perhaps the most compelling reason in relation to fears of coaching in relation to an expert is that an expert's got too much to lose. Um, you know, the man who's a partner in a firm of chartered accountants or forensic accountants is pretty unlikely to, uh, to risk his, his or her reputation by uh, uh, um, wearing a smartwatch and, and taking, taking uh, 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 instructions on the quiet. But the only pro the, the, the usual problem with an expert is bias. But the, the evidence that they give is biased. Let me just get a quick comment in a moment from Paul. Uh, in passing, I might say that although the use of such watches might well be entirely inappropriate during an arbitration, it occurs to me that it would be a jolly good thing for the chairman of a webinar to have, to be able to signal um, unobtrusively to speakers that their time is, uh, their time is nearly up. But um, leave that to one side. Um, I may get uh, into deep water if I pursue pursue that point any further. Paul, have you any comment to make about the haptics watch and about um, the onset of artificial intelligence and technology generally um, in the context of fair proceedings? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with uh, Anthony. It's not a, an issue that's confined necessarily to um, virtual style hearings. Um, uh, uh, obviously, the, the, the more physical the, the environment, the greater control the tribunal or whoever is responsible for enforcement of ethical rules and so on has, um, because they can see what's going on. But, but it, you, you will invariably have cases, physical hearings where people have to be beamed in, or even people are in the room and there's a myriad of means of communicating with people um, through smartphones or whatever, in, even in physical hearings. So it's really difficult to control. I'm not certain that it's a major problem, I have to say. Um, and I agree with Anthony about the fact that you know, expert witnesses wouldn't really be in that position. You obviously have reports prepared in advance and so on, and everything is now quite sophisticated with statements and so on. So I'm, I'm, it's, it's difficult to see how it would, how it would uh, operate to change dramatically the outcome of uh, an event like a hearing or a dispute. Thank you very much indeed. Well, we're nearing the end of our time, but um, there is one more question. Um, which I'd like to um, uh, um, mention. And I think that um, to go back to where we started, um, our colleague, um, Andrew Moran, might be the best person to deal with this one. And this is a question about um, um, the um, effect of remote hearings as opposed to the traditional hearing in which everybody is there in person um, in relation to um, the examination of witnesses, live witnesses, and in particular, I suppose, witnesses of fact where issues of credibility are involved. And I, I, I suppose the question is whether, whether the remote hearing, for all its advantages, will ever really be able to compete with a live hearing where issues of credibility are involved. Uh, um, this is something that worries me greatly. I think I might have uh, mentioned that the case I'm doing uh, next week, the week after next, uh, is uh, a fraud case. And um, as someone who was brought up initially uh, in the criminal sphere, uh, when I first came to the bar, I did criminal cases. Uh, and I'm a, a great believer that uh, Sometimes it's necessary um, to see the whites of someone's eyes when they're uh, lying or telling the truth. Um, impression is still important. We're taught very strictly in international arbitration that it's a dangerous means of determining issues. Um, me, an English uh, white man, Caucasian, um, uh, 
trying to make judgments about the reactions of a Korean um, who will often, when he's accused of lying, um, apologize. Uh, the first reaction is to apologize. So all of these cultural sensitivities are very important and they're more important in international arbitration than most other forms of uh, dispute. So um, I'm worried uh, and next week I'm going to have to listen to witnesses, uh, some of whom are undoubtedly lying about the, the events in the case. There's no halfway house, it's one of those cases, you've all been in them uh, and I'm going to have to find that somebody is not telling the truth. Uh, and I'm worried that the person who is on the wrong end of that finding is going to say, how can he have made this judgment when he's been listening to me through a crackling line? In fact, I don't think it will be like that, but or through a video link uh, when he couldn't see the whites of my eyes, couldn't make a judgment. So it's a real problem. And it's one of the reasons why I don't think we will do away with real hearings um, ever. Uh, we may reduce them, but uh, we need to keep them for certain cases. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and thank you to um, all my colleagues for their contributions. Um, thank you above all to our um, audience, to, the, to all the participants who've been watching and listening to this uh, webinar. We're very grateful indeed to you for uh, being our guests, and we hope very much that you've found the presentations interesting and that they've stimulated some thoughts and some ideas on your part. We would love to have your feedback. Um, there is on the flyer that you've all had um, the email address of our colleague Bridget Tuff. Um, uh, there is also our website um, where you can see all the relevant information about us and our practice as arbitrators and mediators as well as our practice in other areas which I'd very much encourage you to look at. As I say, we, we welcome your feedback. We welcome your suggestions as to future events. <clears throat> and um, um, the next webinar that we hope to put on will encompass, among other things, a reference to the way in which uh, environmental issues arise in arbitrations. Um, environmental law is one of our particular specialities and interests of Six Pump Court. And so, um, the interface between um, environmental law and arbitration is one that uh, we might well touch on in our next webinar. In the meantime, we will be in touch with you. We will be sending out materials as we promised uh, and make them available on the website in the hope that we can stay in touch and see you again before too long. So with that, I will close the webinar and say thank you all very much again. <laughs>